Radio Fallout. And this is how a single particle looks magnified several hundred times. A radioactive piece of matter from a nuclear explosion. generate 
generated by a nuclear explosion is enormous. Near the crater area, there is almost total destruction from blast to heat. Now, large amounts of pulverized debris and molten earth have pulled up into the mushroom cloud. This is where radioactive fallout is formed. The radioactive atoms produced in the explosion join with the particles of earth and debris. Mushroom-shaped cloud forms and climbs higher. It now contains billions of highly radioactive particles of matter that we call fallout. The strong winds of the upper altitudes go to work on the clouds, blowing them off in one or more directions. Gravity tugs on the particles. The larger and heavier ones sink toward the ground, while the lighter particles continue to drift with the wind. Some of the lighter particles remain suspended in the upper atmosphere. As time passes, their radioactivity grows weaker, so that the longer they remain aloft, the less dangerous they are. But the heavier particles spread by high altitude winds and fall to the ground within 24 hours. Several miles from the explosion, they are about the size of the table salt of fine sand. These are the most dangerous because they carry the greatest number of radioactive atoms and so emit the largest amount of nuclear radiation. Which brings us to an all-important fact. Deadly as radiation can be. And this gives us an invaluable ally. Suppose a nuclear explosion takes place at 12 noon. By 1 o'clock, the total force of the residual radiation is at a high level. By 7 o'clock, it's down to 110. In two days, although still dangerous, it's only 1 100. But in two weeks, it's only 1 1 1000. With this decay rate in mind, consider radioactive fallout conditions which might confront us after a massive attack. Within an hour, fallout would be a serious problem in the vicinity of explosions which occur on or near the ground. By seven hours after the attack, the fallout area covers more and more of the country as the prevailing winds expand the fallout in the downwind pattern. 24 hours. 48 hours. Without shelter, millions would face death. A few days later, those who have taken shelter will survive. In many areas, people can even leave shelter for brief periods of time to carry out important tasks. Within two weeks, most people can leave their shelters for longer periods as the radioactivity decays to lower levels. The lesson is obvious. We must shield ourselves from radiation through the dangerous period. To do this, we need more than time. Fortunately, we have another ally. The greater our distance from the fallout particles, the less radiation you receive. You would receive less radiation in the middle of a tall building than you would receive on the top or bottom floor, because there would be more distance and partition between you and the source of the radiation. The fallout particles which would cover the roof and the ground around the building. Only an insignificant amount would get inside. And finally, along with decay rate and distance, we have still another and very important ally. Mass. When highly radioactive fallout covers our immediate area, we can shield ourselves through the most dangerous period by using the sheer weight of any material. But the protective materials must be heavy. To shield out some 99% of the radiation, you would need about five and a half feet of wood. Or two feet of earth. Or one of the third feet of concrete. Or a half foot of steel. Even though 
the fingers of these material fairies, they all win the thing. Taking a house as an example, it offers a small amount of mass and distance from radiation, but not enough protection in an area of heavy force. The solution is plain. All our shelters are the best defense against nuclear radiation. Whether in a hole or a single family, or a large community type in an apartment building, they offer the kind of protection from radiation you would probably need in case of a nuclear attack. Damage. 
with why to remove the radioactive particles by simply washing, wiping, or peeling. But it's vital to remember this. Neither water nor chemicals can destroy radioactivity. The fallout particles can only be moved or washed away. Only time can reduce their potency. And what of water? Well, here again, the same rules apply. If necessary, you could drink water containing fallout particles without worry or immediate harm. The chances are you wouldn't have to for long. But water helps to wash itself through the natural processes of sedimentation and filtration. And swiftly moving rivers like this would carry most fallout particles downstream. simple inverted U-fitting on a ventilating pipe would keep fallout particles from entering the pipe and getting inside. Of course, surviving a nuclear attack means more than just waiting in a shelter for radioactivity to decay to safe levels. Survival, reconstruction, and recovery would involve decontamination in many areas. A very difficult job. Unit 8 at Elman Morse, dose rate 15 Redkins per hour. Okay, Unit 8. Fallout would have to be removed from important areas by street sweepers. And the remaining particles could be flushed out of the way. a problem. After a nuclear attack, we would first use existing food supplies from shelters, markets, and surplus food storage. When fallout had decayed to safe levels, people could begin to work in the fields for limited periods of time. In a few areas, the land would not be suitable for food, but such crops as cotton could be grown. Crops for human consumption would be grown in areas that had received the least fallout. The reason we would be able to grow and eat food planted in this land is that the transfer of radioactivity from soil to plants is extremely low. And so, if nuclear attack should ever come, in spite of every effort to avoid it, we must be able to survive and rebuild for the future. But survival can only come through knowledge. The basic facts we must all know are relatively simple. First, there is nothing new about radiation. It has always been with us. What is new is the vast amount we would be exposed to as a result of nuclear explosions. Much of this danger would come to us in the form of fallout. But we are not without personal weapons or defense. One of these is time. Radiation decays, 
and so we would not have to take maximum precautions indefinitely. Another defense is distance. Radiating particles 50 feet away, for instance, would not affect us as much as particles a few feet away. And our third defense is mass. Any material with enough weight will keep the penetrating rays from hurting us. The greater the weight of the material between us and the particles, the safer we would be. The best way we can use all three weapons of defense is with an adequate shelter, thick enough to shield off a good part of the radiation until it has decayed to safer levels. When radiation attacks, the cells of our body are damaged. Most of them can repair themselves if the total dose over a period of time is not too high. Even though the rays penetrate our bodies causing damage, they do not infect us and make us or anything else radioactive. That's why food remains good no matter how much radiation has passed through it. Fallout accidentally swallowed with water or food will do you no immediate harm. But for long-term safety, it's best to wash, wipe, or peel the food and filter the water. Even if you were caught outside under fallout conditions, ordinary clothing would keep the radioactive particles from touching your skin. But you would still need to find shelter quickly. If we remember these facts, if we act on them intelligently, we can increase our chances of surviving nuclear attack. And the key to survival is adequate shelter. That is why the federal government has a nationwide fallout shelter program. The goal is adequate fallout shelter space for every man, woman, and child. And this goal can be reached. For with knowledge of radiation, we can face the facts about fallout, take action to protect ourselves, and learn how to live in the nuclear age.